Have at it, sir. Wow. Okay. Well, hello. Glad you guys all can make it out tonight. So I'm going to start off with a little litmus test. We got about uh, 30, 30, 32, 33 people here tonight. So I'm curious, um, who here has a little bit over a year with agile development? All right. Ooh, good. Very good. How about a little over a year with actual TDD? Wow, why are you guys here? <laughs> you guys don't need this. Okay. How about uh, more than six months with behavior-driven design? Wow, come on. No one? Oh, this, you guys are in the right place. How about no behavior-driven design? Woo! Okay, well, we're going to have some fun with this one. Any managers? You can identify yourselves like this. Okay? So take home for managers. You know who you are. Uh, essentially, I want to let, let you know that it's useless to send someone to a course and not give them time to implement it. I cannot tell you the number of times that I personally have been the benefactor of about $10,000 in specialized training, only to come back and be told, no, I can't do any of that stuff, and so a year later, I've completely forgotten everything I've taken time for. Okay, so essentially, uh, <coughs> managers out there, the guys who are doing this, um, if you're going to spend $10,000 and get a zero ROI, bad choice. Instead, give, give some time, about the same amount of time as it takes for the training. And uh, you'll actually get some ROI. Okay, so let's talk about what we're going to go over. Uh, essentially, I want to make sure that by the end of this class, you can at least tell me what BDD really is. Um, that you have an understanding of the core concepts. And you'll have a lot of places to go look for more info. Okay? Um, nothing is ever as easy as we hoped before. Where did all this stuff come from? This course brought to you by Five Hour Energy Drink, <laughs> and uh, also this load. <clears throat> okay. Oh, and these, um, and a shelf load of other stuff I couldn't bring in. What I'm doing in this class is <coughs> I'm going to try and give you a really flash fry over the entire BDD spectrum all of the key components that are important to doing it well and doing it right, hopefully inspiring you to move forward, and then um, answer your questions by email, because it's the only thing I can do. Uh, I started off with about five times more material than this. This is about three or four weeks worth of training, all condensed down to an hour and a half. So with that said, let's get going. We're going to talk about the development challenges, because they're important, because you have to understand those. Little project management theory, terribly sorry. <coughs> math, uh, if you don't like math, you're in the wrong profession. Uh, we're going to talk about the BDD basics. We're going to talk about behavioral types. We're going to go over some really simple examples. And uh, then we're going to talk about some future work for you. We're going to start with development challenges. Um, these are hot button topics. I have debated them ad nauseum for hours on end with my friends. Um, so let's not do that because we only have an hour and a half. Okay, so let's start with number one. Challenge number one. The sooner you detect a problem, the cheaper it is to fix. Straight up. The later you detect a problem, the more expensive or difficult it is to fix. Uh, this is on the posters on the sides of the walls. I hope you look at those on the way in. Um, challenge number two, uncertainty. At the very, very beginning of a project, you have no idea what needs to be done. And they're asking you, how long is this going to take? And you say, oh, well, you know, I, I could probably do that in three weeks. And they're like, no, can you do it in two? Sure. Wait, uh, I said three. <laughs> okay. And the major challenge is, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the chaos reports, um, but they're published annually, and these are the numbers that everyone always quotes. And if you look at them, they're really bad. The number of IT successful projects that are failing are under 35% and going down last year. Um, all, that means that barely 70% of projects are failing. Um, you know, but I was wondering, if this is real, why am I getting paid? Because let's face it, if this is real, we're out of jobs. I mean, if somebody had this kind of performance statistics, they'd kick you on the street. Goodbye. Have a nice day. The reason for it is because they're not measuring what you think they're measuring. 
These are numbers by Scott Ambler. He publishes them on his website, ambler.com. Um, and he actually does this every year for Dr. Dobbs' journals. These are the 2010 numbers which were just published. So these numbers break it down by type of project. Ad hoc means, you know, like really quick, we're just going to simplify this, we're going to do this project right now. Okay, we're done. Iterative is structured project management, something where you do round robin, you go back and forth, you do little slices, that kind of stuff. Agile, I hope you know. Traditional is the waterfall or something close to it. Versus the 2009, or sorry, 2010 chaos report numbers. You can see that this is not quite the same. So the take home from this is that 50 to 60% of IT projects, even agile, projects are succeeding. But that also means that 30 to 50% of them are failing. So Agile is not quite the silver <coughs> bullet that a lot of people think it is. Okay. The reason for it is because of increasing effort. Regardless of what happens, you have that cone of uncertainty. Right? The cone of uncertainty says at the very beginning you don't know what you're going to be doing, and therefore when you estimate how much it's going to be done, you're going to go forward. Okay? And what happens is, is uh, the chaos reports is measuring how many projects finish on time, on budget, and in scope for what was originally estimated. That's their criteria for success. If you actually go read their reports, that's exactly what they're measuring. So what they're doing is they're measuring how good we have gotten at predicting what's going to happen in the future at the very beginning. Okay, that's why their numbers are so horribly drastic. Now, interestingly enough. Uh, this year, Dr. Dobbs' journal did this massive study of project management and, and, CE, and C star types. And they said, hey, what's your success criteria for IT projects? None. Zero of them said on time, on budget, on scope. They don't care about on time, on budget, on scope. What they care about is, did it meet my business needs? Did I see an ROI? <coughs> Very different, which means chaos reports measuring <coughs> ether. <coughs> so what's really causing the problem is the unplanned work. You start off, you get da, 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 all of a sudden, bam, you hit the thing, and there's problems, there's errors, and there's fixes. What this is telling me is that we're basically discovering errors late. So the typical development project looks something like this. In the beginning, you have high quality, everyone's good, strong hopes, we're going to do this right, and stuff like that. The cost is very little, just a few people involved, we're doing some designs. Right around the middle, it comes crunch time, and quality <whistles> takes a nosedive, and work goes <whistles> through the roof, as does cost. Now, this green line is the important line. You have to pay attention to this, because the green line <coughs> is business value. At some point, that green line must cross the red line. Okay? If it does not cross the red line, no profit for you. <coughs> You're fired. You're out of business. So, business types are measuring project success based on this green line getting over the top of this red line. Flat out. That's what it's about. Now, Agile, a little bit better. Ad hoc, iterative, agile projects. This is their scopes. Uh, this is from uh, uh, Scott Ambler did some research in 2004, and O'Connell did some other research. And this is what happens because they're short duration, they're iterative. They go for the highest value, uh, the highest value return first. You hit implementation, and bam, there's an instant return on the investment of the effort so far. And because some Agile projects are doing test driven development or they're doing at least better testing. Quality doesn't go down not quite nearly as much. However, there's still a crunch. You know, in most Agile shops, there's still that last crunch for production. Oh, you know, the 60 hour work week is we can kind of rush it out to production. Recent research on behavior driven development, when you use behavior-driven development in an iterative project environment or in a uh, uh, <coughs> short-term Agile project, this is what happens. You have about the same start at the beginning, but there's this weird flux thing that happens here in the middle where the cost doesn't really go very far. But quality, <coughs> 
quality goes up during that crunch. It's kind of weird. But here's the return. So the return on investment of doing iterative or agile or BDD is less unplanned work. The commitment, the investment is more process up front. The ROI of making a change is this minus this. That's called profit. Profit's good. Okay, so what's wrong with TDD? TDD has this huge problem. There's a great book on it right here. Um, where do you start? What do you test? I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. I, I don't quite get it. And, you know, let's face it, everybody hates the word test. Tests are for software testing engineers, quality assurance people. They need to be doing the testing. That's not my job. I'm a developer. I don't do testing. Testing is boring. Not sexy enough. So there's a lot of hurdles to test-driven development. So that's our challenges. Any comments? Are you still awake? Hello? 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 There. <clears throat> Just on your uh, return on investment graph. Return on investment. The, the green line is that the value goes up. Right. Uh, how does it go up before you hit production? What's, what is that? No, it's not. It's implementation. Because you immediately you, you, you have you have your initial <coughs> you have your initial delivery, which is the highest value object. Immediately there's a bump. So that's, so out, that's out live. It's, it's, it's in production. Oh, it's in production. So it's it's someplace. There's business there's return for the money. Right. I mean, there's a money monetary value. That's, so business value is actual profit. In yeah. The yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's live right Yeah, you know, you, 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 hey, you, hey, the customer, you know, in our company, in our company, we get this green line as soon as the customer signs. We do a huge amount of investment up front without the customer signing any. I see that. Okay? All right. So let's talk about a little bit of uh, theory. Sorry. Theory, you're going to need this, and it's really important. Let's talk about the natural natural way things happen. You're hungry. What do you do? Oh, you know what? I need to go out to dinner. Why? Okay, are you hungry? Are you going to dinner because you're meeting your friends? Are you trying to, you know, go out with somebody at the office? You know, what, what's going on? Then you start trying to figure out, well, what, what do I want? Do I want Italian? Do I want a burger? I mean, can we, can we go to the deli? What's happening? After you figure that out, you know, you start working with various people and you're like, well, you know, hey, you know what, we should go here, uh, this is opening over there, we got this idea over here, hey, I got a coupon, right? And then you start organizing, well, we can't go there because it's too far away, I'm really hungry, I want something now. Um, maybe we should send some emails around, see what's going on, we got to get a plan. Then, once you have the logistics, the people, the places, and everything prioritized, you go do it. Okay, this is called the natural planning model. This is how every human being that I'm aware of thinks. It's also how everyone does development. So let's look at development. So test last. Test last is what, let's be honest, the majority of us do. Because, you know, testing is for wimps. I'm good, so I don't need to test my work. It just works. So you have two things to do, stories A and B. And you go, ha! Done. Now, I was like, oh, you know what, I have that code coverage thing. Damn. Okay. So I run a couple tests. Whoa, look, they're failing. Mm, okay. Rework. Oh, that one's failing. Okay. Rework. Oh, wait, that one's failing. Oh, rework. Oh, okay. Now I got them passing the turn in. That's the way we do it. Right? I mean, who doesn't do this? Oh, we got one guy. He does this. <laughs> He does a test first style. The test first style says you take the two stories, separate them. Story A, you think about it. You write some tests. You confirm the test fail. You then implement story A. Story A still fails, you fix, you're passing. Now you're going to write B. Well, you think about it. What do I need to do? Based on what you just learned on A. You write the test, it fails. You write B, it fails. You work, fix it, A fails. You fix that, B still passing, a little bit of work, A done. You'll note that one is slightly shorter than the other. This is true for experienced developers. 
And I don't mean experienced TDD developer, I mean experienced test first developers, I mean experienced developers. There's actually been a number of studies that have shown, <laughs> beyond a shadow of a doubt, test first, the more programming experience you have, the longer you've been in office, the more of a gray beard you are, the better your return on investment for shifting to a test first model. Why? Uh, mostly because the road to success is mostly paid with failure. We've all made the mistakes. So, how can behavior driven design, which is a test first methodology, over test driven development do this? I mean, it's increasing quality and reducing cost. Increasing quality usually means more time on design, more effort up front, more rigorous testing, more process controls. That means more money. But reducing cost means less resources, shorter timelines. It, it, it does, it's like, ah, it hurts. Let's figure out why. So, project management 101. You have four pressure points for doing any type of work on a project, okay? <clears throat> they are scope, quality, resources, and time. Research, case studies, 30, 40 years of, of uh, case studies have proven that successful projects have total control of at least two of these. Without exception, there's no dot outside of the little scatter plot. Projects that do not have at least two fail. There's no success. There's, there, there, there's, there's no case where it's like, we succeeded even though we didn't have any control. None. Doesn't happen. Okay? So, this is my little contribution to math. Every project has a success constant. The second you think of it, it immediately has some value. What that is, we don't know. It's a nebulous, non-existent number. I can't give you the non-real math. But it exists. In order for that project to succeed, you must invest enough energy, genius, and cost, and time to exceed that value. OK? If you do not exceed this value, the project doesn't work. If you do succeed it, it does. So build time and cost are directly related to scope. Build time is usually totally wrong by a huge margin of error, okay? Energy and genius and max time generally are uncontrollable. You have absolutely no control of it. I, I, here's a little fact for you. Believe it or not, everybody in this room thinks at the exact same speed. That is the speed of light. You cannot change the speed of light, at least not yet. Therefore, we all think at the same speed. Therefore, you cannot think any faster than you can think. It took me a while to figure that one out. So let's look at how you can increase project success. We have to change that formula, right? We have to push the numbers. Well, we can add energy. You know, adding energy is really kind of fun. You know, jazz me up, five hour energy drinks, I'm good to go. But, you know, there's a point where my immunity starts building up, <laughs> right? The other thing is you can add resources. Okay, cash. Put cash in. Yeah. Add more people. Cooks in the kitchen. More people going. Kitchen. Okay, pretty soon there's too many people in the kitchen. You can't move. There's too much process overhead. You can't do it. There is a, there is a, a diminishing point of return. You can only invest so much before the next dollar doesn't really yield you very much more. Okay, so the other thing you can do is you can work smarter. Well, behavior-driven design, oddly enough, affects energy and it affects genius. So, let's talk about working smarter. Quality. Quality is time, resources, and scope. Build time is scope and resources. By the way, this all came out of uh, project management books over here. There's three or four of them. Um, so the quality of a given project is a function of how much time you allow it, how much resources you put on it, and what the total overall scope is. Okay, because you can only do so much, right? It's like, I have to slice it this thin, therefore I'm going to put this much quality on that. This much on that, right? 
Build time is how big is it divided by how much, how many people are working on it. Scope. Scope is everything. Okay, so controlling scope is your, you know, is the golden nugget here. And guess what? Behavior-driven design controls scope. Ooh, now people are interested. Uh, so uh, there's this cute little study about the effectiveness of test-driven development, or actually they call it test-first development, because they actually did a controlled experiment on non-agile projects and agile <coughs> projects. And it was really kind of interesting. Test first development, regardless of the process style that was used, produced better quality results. It fit in. The, more, the reason for it was the more tests per unit of code, the higher the quality. And test first, guaranteed, more tests. Okay. However, uh, <laughs> in a 2010 article in Dr. Cobb magazine, a whole survey of people said, I don't like tests. <sighs> what can you do? So, refresh. Behavior-driven design helps scope, build time, quality. There's a lot of heavy lifting, right? It's, got, it's really influencing three of those variables. Little, little, little moment here. Total cost of ownership. I know a lot of developers that uh, actually I invented this game when I was a little bit younger called Over the Wall. And what this game is all about, it's got all these little cute little cards for programmers about tossing grenades over the walls, product development, stuff like this. Because this is pretty much what I was experiencing when I was working. Was the developers would develop the code and go, okay, I'm working on this feature. <laughs> well, yeah, but this is. It's broke. Fix it. <clears throat> what? So, your software that you wrote today is going to live for 20 years. At least. It's almost scary. The person who's going to work on that code is not the person who wrote the code. I mean, we all have legacy code, right? We're all maintaining legacy code. How many of us have sit there and got, it's like, oh, I got to fix this. What the heck? I said, what were they smoking? <laughs> oh wait, that was back when they were allowed to drink at the office. I know where this code came from. <laughs> Behavior-driven design and test first, uh, t any test first development process reduces the cost of ownership because it puts testing methods into place so that you can go and look at the tests and at least confirm that the code is doing what it's supposed to be doing. Okay, this is my, this is my major err. Code is not documentation. I'm sorry. All you Agile guys out there that are Bible thumping Agile guys, no, the code is not documentation. It doesn't work, okay? Code cannot answer the questions. Is it this way because it has to be this way? Or is it this way because it just, that's what I thought of that day, okay? Assuming that your, co that your uh, documentation isn't embedded in the code. Ah, yes. If you're assuming, that's, that's assuming the documentation is not embedded in the code in the form of comments. Um, also, there's a cute little thing we're going to talk about in just a few moments. Yes. If you document the code with comments, then you can't answer those questions. Now, it's a show of hands. How many people have actually got into the legacy code and found excellent documentation about why it was written the way it was? Uh, oh, like two or three people. Okay, well, some of you guys got really lucky. I've seen it. You mean ever I can raise hands. That's right. <laughs> yeah, okay. So the point is, is behavior-driven development is slightly different from test-driven development because it focuses on why and what, not how. So what happens is, is you get your tests are there, and your tests explain why something needs to be. Okay, so one of the things we're talking about is coding by contract. This is where the comments in the code explain the code. Coding by contract is an excellent decision. I, I, well, as soon as I count this, I start doing it religiously myself. 
which is essentially at the beginning of every function, you write some, a little comment that says, that this is what I'm expecting in, this is what I'm guaranteeing is going to come back out, and this is, this is why I did it the way I did it, if there's a reason I did it the way I did it. Okay? And that, that's a really big help. That's a huge help. Okay? Um, the other thing is, is I took this one class, and he's like, and he's like yeah, uh, let's see here, uh, code style requirements. How many of you have code style requirements uh, must comply with Java, stand, you know, some coding styles? Parentheses go here, if then else goes there, right? I've seen lots of code style requirements, and they're always about how to make the code look. Okay, I have, I have a little application. It has a very complex setup. And anytime someone hands me some code, the very first thing I do is I run it through it, because what it does, it takes it, reformats it, puts all the comments in a nice little column over here, puts the if then else is the way I like to see them, and it's done. It doesn't change the code, it just changes the white space. So any code requirement that, that has anything to do with white space, throw it away. It's useless. It doesn't need to be there. Real good code style requirements are uh, limits on cyclomatic complexity, Limits on fan in and fan out. Show of hands, how many people do not know what cyclomimetic complexity is? Wow, okay, good thing I have the next slide. Cyclomimetic complexity. Cyclomimetic complexity is a way to measure the complexity of a piece of code. This is a chunk of, this is a function. Right? Okay, so given this function, here's a function. I start the function, I'm doing this, I have a little loop here. Come down here, I have an if statement, which goes this way, this way, then the function ends. This code's easy to understand. This code, I come in here, I have a little loop here, but wait, this thing comes down here, this is a little if statement which comes down to this one, which goes here, here, and then this one goes to here, but this one can come back up to here, this is a little loop. This code's a little bit more complex. Not too bad. This code. <laughs> this code, here's the paths. One, two, three, four, five, six, there's ten. So cyclomatic complexity is a measure of how many paths through all the logic in the code it takes to get from A to B. And it also tells you how many tests you have to write in order to cover every path. Okay? So, the lower the cyclomatic complexity, the simpler the code. The easier to maintain. Straight up. Fan in, fan out. Fan in is the number of local flows in and the number of data structures accessed. So, here's a chunk of code over here from one of my functions. It reads an array, it reads a binary tree at this point, and there's three other functions that call it. Fan in value, five. Fan out, fan out is the number of flows where I've called out to other functions, and the number of structures I've written to. The method right after this one takes the results, fan, calls these, Calls these two messages right here, right here, fan out, fan out value four. Yes. So if we put um, all the data that our program would ever need to touch into <coughs> the data structure, we can guarantee a fan in of one. Yes, but your complexity would go way the hell up because you have to do a lot of sorting. So the comment was, if we put all of our data into one great big huge structure, does that reduce the fan in? Yes. Does it help? No. <laughs> but it's true. Yeah, I mean. You can manipulate these numbers. I can write a unit test, or worse, I have received a unit test, where the code coverage was 100%. And yet, the tests tested nothing. Test this method, call, try, call, catch, return. Don't check the value you get back. By God, it might be wrong. <laughs> okay. So, measuring and, and doing analytics on your code is one means to improve quality. Acting on them and having discipline is the other. So, for code analytics, hey, put, put limits on your cyclic complexity, fan in, fan out. Lines of code is, it's not really all that great of a measure, but it's kind of interesting to follow. Lines of tests, code coverage, a little coverture report down here. Very, very handy. You do not need 100% test coverage in order to have a good code. In fact, I am not one of these people that says 100% test coverage is a, is a mandatory. You need to have enough test coverage to ensure that all the behavior is correct. 
Okay? This applies whether you're doing agile, whether you're doing uh, waterfall, uh, what's the other ones? Rough, stage delivery, plan iterations, structure project management. The research has come back, it doesn't matter what process is being used around you, you can do this. So, improve design, improve productivity. Improved productivity is a little fuzzy because people start this and they're going, well, you know, I didn't write as much code as I, today as I did yesterday. And, you know, last week I wrote like 500 lines of code. <laughs> How much of it was wrong? I don't know. Well, guess what? That's 500 lines of code that we don't know anything about. Okay? Because the goal here is to be consistently good. So, that's the end of project management theory. Questions, comments? Oh, we're right on time. Awesome. Okay, behavior driven design. Comes from Agile, comes from extreme programming. It was invented by Dan North. Um, I have his paper up here somewhere. You can look at it afterwards. Um, it uses stories. Um, and the point is to communicate from the business decision makers to the programmers. So behavior driven design uses business domain terminology. Not programming terminology, business domain terminology. Okay? It allows a communication channel between the developer and the person receiving the product and, and because of the improved communications, it works out a little bit better. It's still a test first methodology. Okay? So the basic rules still apply. You still have to do requirements. You still need designs. You still need to write code. Wish that didn't work. There. And you still need to run all your tests. The difference is you start with a story. So you define the story. The story is actually a physical file. Well, I don't know. Physical file. That's almost like army intelligence. Um, but you start off with a story. The story is clear. It's written in a very specific language. I'll show it to you in just a minute. Then you confirm you understand what the behavior that's being required. After that, you create a scenario. So in behavior-driven design lingo, the story is your requirement. The scenario is a test, a use case. Okay. Then you write code, check the ring, refactor ruthlessly, loop, and tell story done. Okay. Realize that motion coding does not mean you're making progress towards the end. The only way you can be sure that you're making progress towards the end is if the business requirements, the things that make the green line go up, are being met. You want the green line to go way up, because that means bonus. Okay. Um, testing. I cannot tell you the number of times I have written a test on a very large code base, let me tell you. I have started working on a new feature. I have dreamed up a test. I have written the test. I ran the test, and it passed. I hadn't written any code yet. And that always makes me sit there and go, huh? Because I'm testing for what I'm going to write, but it's already working. Sweet. Job done. <laughs> Move on. <laughs> this happens. This happens because I didn't understand the complexities of the situation, the context of that test. I made a mistake in coding the test. And because of that, the test passed. The feature wasn't there. So if you do not write the test, confirm that it fails, confirm that it meets the requirements, you're not quite sure if it's passing because it's passing, or is it passing because it's actually confirming behavior. That's crucial. That, that's a crucial thing. I love Steve Martin. I don't know how many of you are Steve Martin fans. I'm not going to ask. But Steve Martin wrote this outstanding article for the Smithsonian. If you haven't seen it, it's in the references. I suggest you go read it. I had a lot of respect for him, and then I read this article, and I went, whoa. And he said that early in his career, he realized 
that anybody can be exceptional. Anybody has that shining moment where the stars align and all the code just flows between you and the system and it just works. Oh. Okay, that's random. That's random coincidence. It just happened. It happens to everybody. We all have those moments, you know, some of us more than others, but they're moments. You can't count on them. And Steve Martin actually came up with a philosophy that said, hey, I can't count on my joke getting through. Therefore, I'm going to work on just making you giggle. I just want to tickle your funny bone just a little bit. I just want to be good. I don't want to be great. I want to be good. Okay? So what that means is that means that he started working on that. And I've applied that to kind of like my career a little bit. Which is what it's like you work at trying to be consistently good. And oddly enough, if you're consistently good, you get bonuses. Because everyone thinks you're great. Okay? How do you do that? Well, Sorry. Work from a plan. Prioritize your work. Don't work on something that's not really worth anything. Work on the important stuff first. Do incremental development. You know, if you're going to build stairs, start with the first one. And then build the second one. It works a lot better than you know, start in the middle. Be present. Uh, I teach Tai Chi. This is, uh, this is one of those interesting little things. Be present. It's the hardest thing you can possibly do. Stand perfectly still, slowly moving for an hour and not start thinking about what you're going to be doing later on, what's going on in your head, what happened at work. Being present means consciously being aware, forcing yourself to not be distracted by you. Go, mm -hmm, I'm just dancing. Okay. Never assume. Understand what's required. Rely on reliable things. That one's kind of hard. Document your assumptions. Test the assumptions. Then test the code. Um, and give yourself tangible daily results. Um, this is where I told you behavior-driven design improves energy. Let's face it. When you get something done, it's like, yeah. I did a little dance when my demo started working. I'm like, yeah, all right. <laughs> right? We all get excited. We have that adrenaline rush. We're humans. So when things are working, we're happy. When we're happy, we're good workers, right? Hundreds of years of research has proven that. So, behavior-driven development is test-driven development. Sorry. <laughs> it's a translation, and that's almost all it is. There's a little bit of process around it, but really, it's a translation. It gets rid of that nasty little word called test. And the reason that it does that, that actually, you'd be amazed at how focusing that is. Instead of saying, I need to test this function, I need to confirm this behavior. That's a huge mental shift, even though it says the same thing, syntactically. Um, the recommendation is that you should work with the word should. Why? Well, because you're going to say, this thing should do this. Mm. Now I know what to test for. The translations are requirements are behaviors. Test cases are stories. Test methods are scenarios. And unit tests are steps. So stop using, stop using unit tests and, and test methods, start calling them steps and scenarios. When you talk to the business people using this terminology, their eyes go really like, oh, I understand you. <laughs> Wouldn't the class, uh, the development terminology in that uh, well, the class should do something? So this is, what you're, this is the template of what you should be thinking. This class needs to do this. In reality, the, it, when I show you the example, it's going to be like an object, a noun. So, you're right, the class is a terminal, a program terminology, but... It must be a class of students. Yeah, well, yeah, it could be a class of students. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Thank you very much. Okay, so, be behavior-driven development 
is a very small set of project management techniques. All that stuff I taught you about project management just a little while ago, which is about three books worth, um, that's incorporated into this. They took, they took all of that knowledge, filtered it down, said these are useful things, that's not, okay, we're ready to do this. It wraps test-driven development, and it provides a ubiquitous business domain language for analysis. Very boring stuff. Well, for some people. You know, like for example, I enjoy reading books like this one right here, which is data problem and data structures and problem solving using Java. Ooh, let me tell you. That's some light reading. It's worth reading it. It's also worth reading this book right here. Data structures and algorithm analysis in Java. Okay, this is worth reading. You're professional developers. You should know this stuff. <laughs> Behavior-driven design uses all of that. So you start off with a text file. The text file says story, colon, title, okay, as a, I would like to, so that, business, cash, right? And you know that you're doing good when you can't come up with any more of these. As a sales guy, I would like whiz bang number two so that I just want it. No, sorry, it doesn't work. You need to give me a reason. Give me, show me the money. Use scenarios. The scenarios, a single story file has multiple scenarios, give, which start off with a title. The title maps to a class name. The given is your inputs. The wins are your events and the insurers are what needs to happen, okay? Um, there's more on this, we'll get into we'll have a little demo. So, the story is a narrative. You can have this, this, you have this story as a I'd like to, and then there's also this thing called narrative, the colon, and you can put in like this nice little story about Susan who wanted to do such and such, or Bill who wanted to buy this, or that, that. And it helps really focus down. For those of you who are doing Agile stories, this is straight up. Just take the Agile story stuff, throw it in here, you're done. But the nice thing is it clearly identifies the actor, the behavior, and the business value. You know exactly why you're doing it. The devil's in the details. So the scenarios can be, you have unlimited ands. You can always and together, you can't remove. Very businessy. So given something, given I have a string, and I have a pattern, when uh, I am called, then ensure I print out the pattern modified by the string. Yeah, okay, right? You can put as many ands in here as you want. The word ensure is actually very, very handy and useful uh, because it basically identifies responsibility. If you can't, if you're looking at a, a particular object or a class and, that ob and, you can't, and you can't quite figure out how you need to word it so that it fits that class, guess what? That probably needs to go someplace else because it doesn't belong there. It belongs over here. Leland. Yeah. Um. So I noticed your example, you said given I have a string and yeah, I, made I that. have a pattern. Okay, well, it, it, it's fine. I'm just wondering that that's a very technical language. Yeah, hold on. Language. Okay. Technical language, well, I'm moving into the more general in just a minute. Okay. So, interestingly enough, that text file is executable. That text file is executable. It's one of the reasons it's a ubiquitous language. So there's these things, there's three ways to do this, and this, this took me a long time to figure out. They, they say, oh, it's just easy, you just do this and it doesn't work. And I went, huh? There's three ways to get behavior-driven design to function. You use an embedder, uh, either annotated or configurable, or an annotation builder. Um, it's a little bit difficult, but basically it comes down to one way you're doing direct TDD. Right? I'm just going to run this class, it's going to develop to do this thing. This way is you're using annotation, right? TDD, 
So using annotations to mark everything, you, it doesn't start with test or end with test. The annotations builder, uh, this is the, the dependency injection. So if you're going to do dependency injection using Spring or any of the other injection frameworks, you're basically going to start building your, 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 your classes around this. So I'm going to skip this slide because it's kind of boring. Oh, go ahead. It's important that you write any documentation and any tests with all your assumptions, right? And you assume you make a right, well, not really. I love this feature. Uh, as a matter of fact, I usually write user guides before I write design documents because it lets me focus on the user side of it, right? What they're going to see, how they're going to interact with this, how, you know, and the user could be another system, right? It could be like, a, it could be an API between two systems. The point is, is that if you write these documents, you have total imagination. You have, uh, you have the whole free world to say, I'm going to do it this way, and it's going to look like this. You don't have any code telling you, no, it's not. I'm going to do it this way. You're, you're still writing the user guides within the context of a short sprint, right? It's just the user guide for that sprint. Okay, am I, am I running user guides for that short sprint? Yes, if I'm in an agile development shop, I do. Uh, when, I'm doing, when I do like a sprint zero, normally in an agile place, when I do a sprint zero, one of the things I do at the end of sprint zero is I actually produce a fairly reasonable user's guide. Okay. Then, when we start attacking each piece, we, we go back and go, okay, well, we're doing this, this is what we're trying to do, we're going to look at that, and maybe we need to modify that. But we always start with fixing the user's guide for what we're going to do as opposed to writing the user's guide to match what we did. The reason for it is because it's very liberating. <coughs> you're able to, you're, you're not bound by technology. You can say anything you want. This function will complete in one second. Never mind that it has to talk to that computer on the far side of the planet and pull back 500,000 records and sort them. You can, you, can, you can say anything you want. What do you typically write that in? English. What, what do I typically write the guide in? I write it in English. Yeah. What tool do you use? I mean, that's actually one of the serious issues because we, it's very hard to share those documents. Right? Oh, so what tool do I use to write user's problem. guides? Um, I use a wiki. Okay. 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 Uh, I've always, I like wikis. I've used them a lot. And essentially, um, I usually write them in a wiki. And like at a company like Amdocs, Question. Well, oh. I'll finish what you were saying. Oh, okay. Uh, I thought you were. No, sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do I, is there something on my head? Um, so, uh, like at, uh, at here at Amdocs, we the developers write to wikis, and then there's like a professional writer that comes around and turns that into something you know a little bit more, you know, publishable. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes we need a lot of editing. Um, so, does that answer your question? Yep. Okay. So this is very similar to what we do. We always require for all our stories we have to have acceptance criteria, which is basically defined by the business side as to what they constitute as, as the criteria for that story to be finished. So something very similar to what you're talking about, the user guide there, it's more focused towards the end user as to how they use a feature or do something and then call it done. Right. So the, so the comment is actually this is pretty much like what he's talking about where they write the user's guide first, you have a lot of requirements up front, that kind of stuff. Yes? All the way back. Um, your example of um, a story where it's very unreasonable or unrealistic to be able to produce that uh, that story, you know, grabbing uh, data from the far side of the world and uh, 5,000 records or 5 million records, and you're going to sort it all in one second. Yeah. Um, how, does, how can you reconcile reality versus. Okay, so the question is. is if your user's guide is so totally off left field, how do you deal with that situation? Yeah, because and the way you deal with that situation is, you st is when you start developing the requirements. Your requirements are based off the, the, the initial stories. You find out the stories are incorrect, and you, start, and, you, and you go back and you fix the stories, and then you fix the requirements. It's, it's iterative. You go back and you, and you go back and around. Yeah, but you're, you're setting up the expectation that isn't going to uh, pan out. So you're, well, of course. You're using these stories. Okay.
Okay, so the comment is, is so you're setting up, you're, you're setting up, you're setting them up for huge expectations, and then you're going to take it away. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I can honestly tell you, I have never done that. Honest, honest to goodness, I tell you that you have open field, and I do use open field. I have never disappointed the users when I have brought them a user's guide and said, "This is what I'm thinking about. What do you think?" So, within you know, it's within reason. Okay. One last question, and then we're going to have to move on. I, 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 can't, I, I can't really debate that one right here. On the executable nature, is it the user guide that's executable, or the user guide helps you produce something? The user guide helps you produce the stories which are executable. On the executable part, is, there, is this going to be, I have trouble justifying that? Uh, well, I'll show you. I'll show you. Okay, so I'm going to move on. Anyone else have questions, just hold on to it for a second, because I think we might be able to answer them just a bit. Okay, so what's the simplest thing? You're always doing the simplest thing, which is all of your tests are running, all of the behaviors are passing, there's no duplicate code, really hard. There's a great book on refactoring, it's about this thick. Get it, read it. Okay, uh, I already said this. The, the, the more experienced you are, the better chance you have of writing a decent document up front, okay? So, Quick recap, improve design, why? Because you're writing tests based more off of the behavioral descriptions. You have improved productivity because you know that you're done when you're done, right? Test passed, I'm done. You also know what to do next because the stories are guiding you. Your, the quality's improved, more tests per unit of work and reduced total cost of ownership because, well, there's behavioral descriptions that explain what it's supposed to be doing, why it's supposed to be doing it, and then people can go, well, it's doing it this way because they need to do it that way or something else. Um, so, BDD does improve test-driven development. Behavior-driven development fixes the test-driven element issues. It answers, where do you start? You start with the business requirements. You work on the highest priority behavior first. What do I test? Anything that can be expressed as should or should not. This should do that. This should not happen. Right? If you can't think of anything else that it should do, you're done. Story met. What should you not test? Anything that doesn't fit. Right? If you can't put it in this context, you can't test it, you shouldn't be writing it. Okay? How much do you test? All of the behaviors necessary to ensure that you feel the story is being met. And it's plainly described in a business analysis language which is easily analyzed by you and the people receiving it. You can get solid confirmation. What do you call the tests? Well, the tests match the actual descriptions, which is basically should do X, should fail for Y, blah, blah, blah. So basically, BDD dramatically improves your productivity. Uh, let's see here. Be prepared. Be Boy Scout. Uh, anticipate your risks. Knowing how to react. Doing what is necessary. These are all things I'm not going to hammer these in too much more. So, <laughs> now that you know that it's tests, the next section is called testing basics. You're all going to be tested on it at the end. Questions, comments? Okay. So let's go over some testing basics. This is uh, uh, this book and that book and that book. So, uh, I'm going to try to do this in 10 slides, I think. Test cases. A test case describes its inputs, the events it's expected to see, what the results are, any prerequisites, what the environment must look like, and it has to be authoritative. That one's the one that a lot of people miss. A test case must be authoritative. It, one test case, one issue. Okay. What that means is that means that if this test fails, that one thing finishes. You can't change something over in left field and have this test fail at the same time those tests over there fail. 
If you have more than one test fail at the same time and you only change one thing, then you have some test cross coverage and you need to fix that. What is a defect? <laughs> defect is called a mobile. <laughs> um, defect is anything that reduces value. Okay? So, two types. Behavioral means that the application is not doing what the user reasonably expects. I hit save. It should have saved. It shouldn't ask me, am I sure? Right? If the, if the user says, this is what I think it's supposed to be doing, and I it really should do this, then you know what? It's a, it's a defect. It doesn't matter whether it's designed, you know, whether the specification says something else. It's what they should reasonably expect. You know, the customer is always right. Okay? A specification defect is a little tricky because a specification defect means that there's something different between the way the actual application is running and the way the specification was written. Now, a specification defect may or may not be a defect because it might be changing the behavior to, be, to match what is reasonably expected. So when you have a specification defect, sometimes you change the specification, sometimes you change the behavior. Classifications. Tests are classified. Positive test cases, oh, these are so simple. Best case scenarios. These are handed to you on a silver platter called the specification. This is what it's going to do. Woohoo! Okay, that's your positive test case. Negative test cases, these are incredibly difficult. This is a huge amount of work to learn how to do these well. You have to tease out what it takes to find some, something to make the application go completely left. Okay? Perspective based is you can have it. Everything is either functional or structural, or it's functional, non-functional. And it's, I don't know if some of you, this might make a little bit of weird sense. Functional is what needs to be tested in the event that technology doesn't matter. Given a perfect world with unlimited computing resources, unlimited speed, unlimited bandwidth, unlimited resources, is it still a test? Okay, if it's still a test, it's testing a business behavior. It's a functional test. If it's not a test, given a, uh, given unlimited resources, then it's a non-functional test, also known as a structural or glass box test. The structural or glass box test is saying, I'm testing this because I don't trust the technology. I need to confirm performance. I need to confirm that it doesn't use too much memory. I need to confirm you know, that algorithm A is being used properly. Functional tests are gold. Identify them, protect them, treasure them. Because that's where the money is. Structural tests come and go with technology changes. Okay? Types of testing. We'll start off with acceptance testing. That's basically where you think the client's like, yeah, that works, or no, no payment for you. System. System testing is, a, is usually automated. I hope it's automated. It better be automated. Where you take and you say, these are all the behaviors, and this is the way it's supposed to perform. Giving these inputs, I get these outputs. We're good. Integration testing is a little bit more specific. A lot of people confuse these two. Integration testing is any type of testing that takes one component and another component and makes them work together. Okay, system testing is top to bottom, the whole bloody thing. Integration testing can be middle layers, top layer, bottom layer, you know, it can go anywhere. If it's two things working together, it's an integration test. Okay, unit testing or programming tests, sorry, programmer tests, these are, the, these are things that test a specific case, a specific method, a specific class, and they're usually, they need to be kind of, you know, atomic. Regression testing. Regression testing was the previous versions of acceptance and system tests. Right? 
you're confirming previous behaviors. And of course, beta, which is the only kind of testing most people do, is here you go. <laughs> Let me know if there's a problem. <laughs> okay, I hope by now you figured out what a good test is. A good test is item potent. I can run it 77,000 times today, and it will fail always for the same reason, and it will succeed always for the same reason. It's atomic, meaning it doesn't need anything else. I am entirely independent. Simple, fast is good. Fast is not necessarily a requirement, but fast is good. Fails for one reason and one reason only. Nothing is worse than a test case 17 tests deep. It's like, oh, it failed on line 76. Hmm. Okay, what's going on? It's unique for specific behavior and improves your test coverage. Um, this one took me a long time to find, so I'm going to give it to you for free. Fixture. When you're reading testing manuals on, on how to write tests and how to write user requirements, they're always talking about fixtures. What the heck is a fixture? Nobody defines it. So a fixture is a test case with all of its preconditions, all of its assumptions, and the runtime context. A test fixture is a functioning running test and all of the little bits around it. Okay, so Merry Christmas. That's it. Questions on testing basics? Just um, one comment. I've seen some testers who think that it's a good idea to have random data in their tests. Okay, random, okay. Comment on testers who think random data is a good thing. Um, random data implies that the test can fail for unknown conditions. Now, there is some situations where actually that's not too bad. Um, you'd have a really hard time justifying it to me. <laughs> I mean, but I mean, I, I can, this is a huge universe. I'm sure there's a reason to have it. I just can't think of one, and I've never encountered one. Um, so. Well, the, the obvious example is testing, you get, say, even distribution out of something that's meant to generate random numbers, right? I mean, okay, so. The, like the so thing. random data to assure even distribution of numbers. Okay. Which you generate problem, of course. Which you generate because you're generating them randomly. Right, so random yeah. number doesn't random number generator doesn't okay. guarantee uniform. Side debate. No, I know. No, Side debate. The question was the, the purpose of doing that. The purpose is when the value of the test is relatively low. And so you just want to pass through coverage to say that it's likely this test will. Well, okay, so the comment was is that uh, the justification for that was the test value is low. Note, if a test value is, is so low that it doesn't matter if it passes or not, throw I it away. Say that. So what I would say is I'd say, you, I actually use random data all the time. I use random data to generate the input sample for my test. Once I get that, I encapsulate it into the test so that it's always the same from there on, right? So, that's it. Any other questions, comments? Well, it just seems like if you were going to use a, a truly random number, then you'd have to run a whole bunch of tests over yeah, and over and, again. Yeah, to use a truly random number, you have to run a whole bunch of tests. Yeah, and, and to be honest, I'm, I, know this, I, know, I actually know someone who did that, and I don't want to do that. They're, they're, mathematics are annoying. Okay, so let's talk about where this stuff goes. Let's get on to actual meat. We're going to do the real stuff now. So, the red tape. Where does stuff goes? If you're using Maven, uh, who here is not using Maven? Ah, me. Oh, good, okay. So for you guys who are using Maven, this is a good idea, but not necessary. Okay, so. Uh, your source tree, you can put your tests, you can put your test cases in the package, or you can put them in a separate directory called tests. For Maven, Palm, you have source, main, Java, your stuff, resources, test, Java, and your resources, okay? So you put your, I put test classes over here, you don't have to, you can, put them, you can mix them in. Um, what's nice, um, minimum entry for your Palm. So it's like, this is my example. I have one Palm, 
I have one, presenter is given class cost story, dot Java. I have one steps class, which is my unit tests, which is class cost steps, guess which class that applies to, class cost. And I have, in the resources directory, I have one text file called presenter is given class cost story, dot story. Okay, this by the, th this, this story here and this story here is requirements of the default configuration for behavior driven development for JVM tying. You can manipulate it all you want, and in fact I normally do. I normally do it so that I don't have to have this redundant story story here. You can, you can change the configuration so that it knows how to do this, but I'm, this is just a minimum entry point. Okay, so this is the defaults. So, just so you can see what happens. This is a text file, okay? This text file maps name for name to this class. This class is your JUnit suite, okay? It's the entry point for the JUnit framework. This class is your unit tests and it consists of a number of steps which are associated per the story requirements for each scenario. We'll go over how that works, okay? So here's my example story. Presenter is given a class cost story. So in this case, we're gonna write a class which computes the value of a meeting. We have X number of attendees, we have meetings this long, and this is the average cost, right? So the story is calculate the effective business cost of a meeting. As a presenter, I can compute the meeting business cost so that the return on investment for a meeting may be known. Hey, everybody got that, right? Okay, scenario. Presenter entrance class count of 10. Okay. Given an average hourly rate of $50. When attendance count is set to 10, then ensure class cost should be 500. Okay? So, this is the text file without the colors. Story, description of the story, test case. This maps to a unit test suite structure which then hunts down steps based off of matching this stuff to run this scenario. And, remember I told you to make assumptions? One of the biggest, funnest things about programming is you don't have to keep a to-do list. Why? Because the compiler will tell you what you need to do next. Every time you compile, I need this. Oh, right, okay, here you go. I need this. Right, okay. Never have to worry about that. Class one of two classes total. Class presenter is given class cost story. Extends JUnit story. Okay? So this is your entry point. This is one of the embedder things that we talked about earlier. It has one method, public configuration. This right here is where basically I create the return new most useful configuration which is the default configuration for behavior-driven development using this framework. And I say it uses a story loader from, which is actually just the class loader. And it says use the story report builder putting out to the console and text. So that, that's, that's it for the configuration. I'm just saying, hey, throw it out into text and the console and use the class loader to find the scenario stories, right? That's about as small as you can get this. Also, I'm specifically overriding the steps class because what I'm doing is I'm saying it lists candidate steps and I'm handing it a reference to my candidate steps class. Okay, because this, this is not the annotation embedder. The annotation embedder would just find what it needs, so you don't need that. This is the standard embedder, so basically I have to tell it, oh, use this, use this class for steps. Class two of two. Public class, class step. Done. 
I now have a test-driven development framework in place for this application that will run. So in the palm, I have JUnit dependency and I have JBehave dependency. So can you explain that for those who are so on? Sure. What? Palm Maven readers. What? What are you, what are you so showing here? So palm is a pro, uh, project object model, yeah, right? right? But so you, you define your dependencies. Your dependencies are JUnit version 3.8. These are jars you're depending on. These are just jars. Yeah. It's okay. And I'm looking for the JORG behavior, JBer Maven plugin because I'm running through Maven. This version. Okay. So basically, all it does is add these to your class path. So in Eclipse or JBuilder, uh, you just add these jars to your thing and say run as unit test. Can you put the second one in the test code? Or should you? Yes, you can. Should you? Build? You can. No, you don't have to. Because it runs it integrate. By default, this is default, behavior driven design runs at the integration test phase. Okay. If you, <clears throat> which I, I run BDD at both the test phase and also the integration test phase. I write two separate chunks of test. This testing directory is unit test, this testing directory over here is for unit integration test, and I have it run at both locations. So yes, if I scope this, if I, put, if I copy this line right down here, this would run immediately as, as when I ran unit tests. But since I'm gonna do a Maven package on the next command line, <clears throat> which will do an integration test, it's okay. Why is the plugin uh, dependency instead of being put in the plugins section? Ah. <clears throat> um, I don't know. <laughs> why is why is this not in the plugins things? I I, I don't know. It isn't. It might work either way. Wait. That's because it's on the next slide. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> so, the rest of the palm, plugins, and then you, this is this is where you control where it runs in the test scope where you're going to put it. Okay. Um, these slides are going to be available. I don't really, don't really. What I want to get to is this. This is the interesting part. So, given those two classes and a text file. If I run right now with nothing else written, totally empty, this is what I get. Story, calculate the effective business of constant as a presenter, so I make a com, present, like, com da, 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 presenter is given class story. Okay, scenario, presenter says, given an average hourly rate of 50, pending. When class attendance count is set to pending. Da, 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 da. Reports, view generated, one story, one scenario, zero failures. So without anything to test, it has parsed the text file, found a scenario, and said, hey, you know what? You haven't written these yet. Now, you can flip a little bit in, the, in your palm to say pending is a failure. It defaults to pending is not a failure. Okay, so that's about it. Now, interestingly enough, that was JD Hay, which is Java. There's Cucumber for Ruby, and there's Lettuce for Python. Why? I don't know. But needless to say, every last one of these will run the same text file. Right, that's, that's story scenario file. If I drop that into place, if I, if I change this over and I fire a cucumber and feed it the same thing, it'll give me the same results. Okay. So now we're ready to do some work. So I go into my class cost steps and I add, start adding meat because I have pendings. So what I do is I use the annotations at given and here's a regular expression uh, regular expression the dollar sign indicates a variable what I say average count rate 
attendance count is set to the, ensure the class cost be da da, and then I write this. This is a pojo. You know, this is not extending anything, this is not implementing anything, this is not doing anything. All we need is three, three little imports so that the annotations work. So now, if I make this change and don't put anything in here, I have the kind of unit tests I get back from other <laughs> shores. And when I run the test again, it now comes back and says, hey, I ran one story with one scenario. These all passed. Because it didn't fail, right? You have to put the meat in there. That's because you've got text matches. Right. So if you look, given an average hourly rate of $50. So if we go back here, given, which is the annotation, and average hourly rate of variable. That variable will get shoved into here. It will automatically figure out all three of them, you know, for all the languages, will automatically typecast it to whatever the expected input is supposed to be. So if it's supposed to be a double, it takes a string and turns it into double. If it fails, it gives a different, it gives a different type of error message. Okay? So these expressions on the steps are how it matches up the step to the scenarios. Now, I, if I write these things well, I can create scenarios. If I have, say, 50 or 60 steps, I can write a couple thousand scenarios varying the inputs. And before someone asks, yes, you can do tabular inputs. So you can say, given this table, value, 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 value. So you, can, so you can do one of those, you can do the, the uh, domain analysis. Okay? Then you can continue. This is another story. This is, this is what I was actually thinking of. So this is, this is a really cropped up bad story. Replace tokens in a string. As a user, I'd like to replace a token in a string of values so that I can create templates for my configuration files. Scenario, replace empty string. Given I have a string templater, when I ask to replace an empty string, I get an empty string. Scenario, replace string without tokens. When I have you, know, you just start writing this text file. At, if you think it like, oh, I need that, to check that behavior, you can just go at it. Right? It takes you like it, it, it takes you grand total ten seconds to write a new scenario. Maybe a little bit more if it's complex, but really, if you just like, oh yeah, I got to test that. Now all you have to do is go to this text file, add the scenario. You'll get pendings. And if you have pendings as errors, then you know your, your code won't pass. Okay. So that's BDD really, really fast. I can show you some I can show you some live examples. Um, let's get the summary so then we can call it into the meeting. Where am I at? I'm doing good. So project success depends on understanding your requirements. Okay. Properly scoping the work, which is an ongoing effort. Okay. And more tests. Lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots, lots of tests. Good tests. Okay. Test first programming is beneficial. I don't care if you use BDD or not. Test first programming, learn it, do it, be good at it, whatever you want to call it. BDD is really, really good because it has, gives you these textual scenarios. You can give these textual scenarios, you can put them up on the wall in scrum meetings. You can use you know, the, the agile storyboards. Because you know we actually use we actually almost use this almost uh, here at uh, Amdocs we use almost the thing as a so that uh, so I can right I can so that blah blah right it's it's pretty simple and it's straight up future work <laughs> so I leave it to you to read these books um, it's BDD is built on X unit in all languages. Okay, it's actually now available in, I think, in almost every major development language, including C++. And it's, and it's always built on the XUnit framework for that language. Okay. If you're going to do good test design, you're going to, need to use mocks because you need to make it item potent, and you need to make it atomic. Who here doesn't know what a mock is? Okay, well, a mock is a something that you can substitute for something else. So it's like, I want to talk to a teller, I'm going to make this pretend teller like a doll. Okay, design patterns. 
the more design patterns you know and can regurgitate, the more of a geek you are. The more design patterns you understand and know when to apply them and when not to apply them, the better developer you are. Um, I'm, I, design patterns are only useful in that they help you recognize patterns. You say, oh, this is doing this. Is that appropriate for the behavior? Okay. Um, learn to do requirements analysis. That's really, really important. I like agile modeling. Uh, UML, all that good stuff. So, take homes. Iterative projects have a better chance for success. Okay? So, short iterations, horizontal, vertical slices, whatever you want to do, it doesn't matter. As long as you have a way to do a little bit of work, come back, and get the next chunk of work, and the next chunk of work is based off what you just learned, you have a better chance of success. It doesn't matter whether you're doing waterfall or anything else, if you can come up with some way to, to, to get that spin going, do it. It's going to be worthwhile. Um, write your user's guides and behaviors with assumptions built in. Let the compiler tell you when you're wrong. Um, strive to be consistently good. Study patterns. Uh, much thanks to these guys. They actually sat through this a couple times and gave me some really nice feedback. And for references, these are the specific papers and books and stuff like that with page annotations and stuff like that. I'll be putting this thing up um, for you know, general consumption. Now, who questions? Wrote BDD, the, huh? Who's, where'd it come from? Who wrote the? Who wrote BDD? Who wrote the uh, the annotations and all that support, all that? I mean, um, BDD came from. Agile, Kent Beck uh, was one of the contributors to it, but essentially it was Dan North. And I actually have the original paper here, Agile Testing Strategies. Here it is. So here's the original paper that introduced BDD's concept from Dan How old North. is it? How long ago? How long ago? Oh, 2001. 2000, two, 2001, Dan started experimenting with it. He coined the phrase behavior driven development in 2003. Um, and uh, then a couple of people got involved with it, came back in a few, in a few of the other big names. And like I said, it's, it's, it's essentially TDD shifted left. So having done XP, this sounds like XP with fit without the pair programming and without the negative baggage that XP this sounds like XP without the negative baggage. Ooh, that's a charge. Um, I don't know. Um, I, you can Behavior-driven development is essentially writing the requirements, building the text cases, and doing that. And you can do that with XP. You can do well, that with the pair program. Yeah. Well, no, but XP uses the term test. It does test-driven development. See, but, so, so if you shift it from test, if you start using behaviors, Start using the word should. Again, what you're saying is that I want to remove the, 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 the negative annotations of certain words that XP uses. Yes. But you're doing exactly the same thing, but yes. without the pair programming and using fit, you know, using using this tool instead of saying fit. No, this this tool doesn't quite. This tool doesn't. I I don't know. I actually I'm not quite convinced that J behave replaces fitness. Fitness does a high level smoke integration testing level. BDD is based on J unit and X unit stuff, which is down at the unit and programming tester level. It does a better job at the integration testing. And because of the way it's structured together, you're able to do a little bit more of the flexibility with it. Um, I'm sure you could replace fitness with it. I haven't. I have used this at my workplace. It's been very successful for me. Okay, um, I uh, we we do test driven development, and the majority of our product development side of the house is actually uh, a side of the house that I haven't worked with directly for about six months. John can answer that question better. How? What's the question? 
Are, is anybody doing be behavior-driven development over PD? Not that I'm aware. Of. Not, not, not quite. Yeah, yet. we do. We do pretty TDD stuff. Although I don't know, it's not like rigorously enforced. So, so yeah, it's know. also a source of large amounts of empty tests. A little more than uh, yeah. Some of the tests are not as good as others. Um, I don't know. My, I'm going to bounce this idea, uh, this concept off some people, so we'll see if. Yeah, well, I was supposed to show. I'm, I'm supposed to actually. I'm going to be redoing this presentation for uh, our some of our directors, so it's going to be kind of interesting. Um, I have taken other X unit frameworks, specifically SH unit, and modeled it into BDD. And I have done BDD driven development with SH unit for projects I've been involved with. Now, my problem is getting developers to actually sit down and do it. Okay? Because unless they perceive that they're doing something useful, they're not going to do it. Um, so, I mean, studies are in, it does well. So, next, yes. So, I have a comment and a, a question. And I think, um, I think kind of what you were saying comparing this technology to FIT. It is a little different, but I think that the parallel is that uh, they both are striving for uh, read, both readable and runnable tests. Yes, fit, fit and behavior-driven development are both striving for readable, runnable tests. Um, I think behavior-driven development does a little bit better than fit because there's not this huge infrastructure you have to build to make it work. That, that's right. One of the, one of my big complaints about fit and one of the reasons why I want to throw it out the window is that it's only as good as the fixtures that you write, and sometimes you end up with all these uh, crazy fixtures where you're like, really? And it, it, they're doing all this magic under the covers, and so then the readability of it, it, it looks nice, and it passes, but it doesn't necessarily mean all that much. Um, that's my, my feeling yeah. about fit. As, as far as... Um, and then, then my question is, as far as this goes, this seems like this is super unit focused. So, there, do you know of any kind of like research to apply these concepts to like user interface testing? Because that's one of the biggest pain points ah, here. user interface testing. Yes, actually, there is. Um, I I highly recommend this book, uh, David Estelle's uh, Test Driven Development: A Practical Guide. Behavior-driven development is test-driven development. So anything that says starts with test-driven development can be applied. This actually has an entire, like almost 100 pages on how to do user interface testing using TDD methodology. Um, it's really, really, and oddly enough, it reads well. So um, I'll, I'll maybe uh, drop you can, you can borrow you can borrow that if you want. No, because I I, 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 I don't want to go into user interface. Because yeah, interface that's, I mean, the so let's see here. Um, can I make a question comment? I mean, because I that's always what strikes me with these presentations on on TDD and BDD is they always look at the UI. They always ignore the UI. They always ignore the database. They always talk about like how do I do a function? And it's like that's not a hard problem. It's like writing a class that correctly computes a function isn't where the bugs are, right? It's like if, if you can't write that, you should probably have it. Probably not working here, right? I mean, but it's like the UI is the hard stuff, the communication protocols, the database layers, I mean, that stuff is where the bugs are. It's always like, but how exactly you solve those problems seems like it's, that's the part I'd love to see in these presentations, right? It's like, that's the part I don't know how to solve. That's why we don't adopt TDD, is because it's like, on the hard problems, don't know how to do it. And I'm sure there's people who do, but it's like, how do you go at the hard stuff? How do you not? So, yeah, so, so, the, so really the, the, the statement is, is, it's hard to adopt this because it's difficult. It's difficult to, you know, it's, and, it's, it's because the explanations don't focus on the hard parts. Yeah, they're and, and you know what's, what's really, it's funny you should say that because a long time ago when I actually first printed, I was laughing when I was getting ready for this, uh, um, here it is. So this is, this is the Dan North paper, right, on behavior driven development, which I printed off uh, a couple years ago, and I read it, and my very first reaction was this. Not easy. Not easy. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's not, it, it really is not easy, which is why I have that management take home for managers, which is essentially anytime you get some of the stuff, it takes a little while to build, build up into it. Um, you can do this, the fastest, the fastest way to learn this is mentoring or coaching, having someone sit next to you and actually push you on it. A lot of places can't afford that. So before, before we go any deeper, 
Um, on the walls are some of the graphics that I use for this. I also have uh, more of them, so take them if you want them. So I have the cone of uncertainty, the cost of estimation, and of course the ever famous tombstone. I love the tombstone one. Uh, so if you, want, if you want some of those, help yourself, please take them with you. And I also, uh, who wants a free book? Ooh, yeah, look at that, yeah. There you go, one more to So uh, I have some of my favorite books here. One's called Softer Esti Estimation, Demystifying the Black Art. And the one is Code Complete by Stephen Kahn. Oh, we got some t-shirts. Oh, we got some t-shirts. So how are we going to do the giveaways? Your call. My call? Oh, Your gosh. <laughs> how we do business cards and, and a draw? OK. So business, anyone who wants, anyone who wants to know the good stuff, business card up here. Or a piece of paper. Or, or, or a piece of paper. Yeah. Preferably a sticky, so it sticks to my finger. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what is that? Do you have a paper? Oh! Okay. Anybody interested in Open Solaris? Version Wow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe from last year. That would be a no. Version one. Anyone? Poster. All right. Okay. So, any other questions while we're waiting for business cards? No, wow, oh, you guys no, are just overwhelmed. I, I have two things. Yeah, two things. One, I would say 80% of our bugs, issues, whatever you want to call it, are caused by either inadequate requirements, like where they weren't captured properly, or misunderstood requirements. Yes. So it seems like this would really help in at least getting the business side more involved in, in clarifying exactly what it is that they're trying to do and what they want to see as the end result. Right. And one extension on uh, what you presented there as far as the story and the definition of terms, one thing that we've added to that is uh, defining done in the specifications. Mm -hmm. Done criteria. Exactly. Yeah, and, and that makes a huge, a huge yep. difference because you can both enforce it on the developer, stop working on it, yep. you've met the requirement, and when it goes back up and they say, well, no, that's not quite what I wanted, then that's an update. And you'll have to update it. Yeah. So, um, done criteria is a, is a wonderful tool for getting getting us taken care of. Uh, we put them on the end of all every last one of our backlog items that we put into it. Um, we have a done criteria on it that's very very specific. The done criteria in behavior driven design literally turn into test scenarios, or in some cases, a done criteria might be a whole story file by itself. Um, Again, behavior-driven design is mostly a thought shift and learning how to do TDD well. And what I want to make sure you understand is, is that uh, it, you don't need to use Maven. You don't need to use any particular framework. It runs on top of XUnit, um, but you don't have to use XUnit either. You can, you can, you can just do, just, uh, just applying this thought process to the testing methodology that you're currently using yields about the same results. Okay. So there's no there's no hard sale here for any particular chunk of technology. Um, do I have everybody's cards and names and stuff? This will be fun. All right, marketing materials shortly to come. The mailing list being sold. All right, so I'm gonna put these back here. And... Um, let's see here. First one is the guy who uh, you could cry about your paper. Price. Yeah, you pick, pick which prize I'm giving away. I oh. have a Grab one. Grab, Grab anyone. How about the book? Fire. I don't know if anybody Fire. really wants this okay. or not. You many should, you should do it. Yeah, order. Tony Vigil. Vi no, we're not going to do a. Actually, we're not going to do no. a white elephant. No. Tony Vigil. What book do you want? Jower caps, basics, implementing you know, comedy. You, you, you want to trade with someone who can negotiate the trade value next time. Okay, next book. <laughs> Next giveaway. Um, oh, they're both Steve McConnell books. Software estimation. Yeah, Bob Foley. Yeah. Is that the one you want? One? Sure is. But well, the other one's yeah, Steve McConnell too. So code complete too, which. No, actually, they're not. They're both Steve McConnell. Yeah. Uh, mean Lee. Mean Lee. Mean Lee. Yeah. There you go. You already have that book? Sorry. <laughs> uh, I might. I might? Okay, I'll show you. 
Next giveaway. Uh, t-shirts. Uh, Thomas. There's like Mac. tons of t-shirts. Uh, white, black. Uh, Glass, white. white. What's the name of a video game? Black and white. <laughs> next, next giveaway goes to Dodge and Jacob. White, black. White. <laughs> I think they're all extra. Next large. giveaway. Just for all Expediters. Who's Mark Blesko? Well, right. Ned Beans, Glassfish. They have different t-shirts, I guess. And the next one should go to Sherry Smittle. She's not here. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, who, gave who, gave who gave me Sherry's card? That's good. And Mark. 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 <laughs> 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 Catch. Toss. No still. <laughs> next one goes to Douglas Pearson. And we have choices, one or two. <laughs> this one looks more like should. Okay. <laughs> Next one goes to Chris Wilkins. All right. Got okay, anything else? Uh, nope, that's it. That's it? All right. Well, thank you, uh, Leland, and thank you, folks. Have a happy new year. We'll see you guys next year. Leland,